And so you can see those photos. It shows that the Chinese culture chest at that time represents Taiwan as a bastion of Chinese culture and a beacon of Chinese culture to the whole world. You know, 1960s and uh, you know, Communist Party, uh, PRC, and Taiwan, Republic of China, is uh, you know, very much in terms of uh, uh, different position, up, uh, person, just like a uh, different situation. Next. So, in the 1970s, Culture Chess traveled to New York, Boston, Hawaii, uh, Seattle, Chicago, uh, Melbourne in Australia, Panama, and uh, 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 Japan and Thailand, everywhere. And what is it about? A metal, a mediocre metal box like that play an important role for culture diplomacy. Okay, next. And also we draw a map and we find out the map that culture, Chinese culture chest travel to the world is getting more and more. And at the end of the day, we cannot help to enlarge the map to accommodate those red lines. And more coming. And we have more phone call from from the whole world that, hey, we find that there's some metal uh, uh, chest in our storeroom. Is that yours? Do you want it? Something like that. So we are collecting them back. Okay, next one. So this is the real, uh, the photo that we took for you. Uh, some Chinese culture chest in France, Taipei representative. Some in uh, 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 Thailand, Australia, and different photos. Okay, next. And uh, we are trying to, we also have a Chinese culture chest in our storeroom. And that is the memory of 40 years in Taiwan. How Taiwan promotes Chinese culture as a so-called cultural diplomacy, even though there is no such term at that time. Next. Okay, let me get to my conclusion. It's so important that when we come to talk about the issue of cultural diplomacy and it deal it for me it involved with so called how do we communicate with each other. Diplomacy in culture is not try to persuade people to, to believe you with power. Cultural diplomacy is a process of dialogue and understand each other. This is how I feel. Through the Chinese culture a chest we are going to rebuild that kind of relationship with the whole world. Hopefully, we can open a new channel for Taiwan to talk to the whole world without United Nations. Okay, so uh, today we have uh, four excellent uh, scholars to talk about the issue. And uh, uh, the topic, as I said, the cultural diplomacy, relations theory, and the latest research development. And uh, the general overview on the uh, latest development of theories and the research on cultural diplomacy and uh, cultural relations. What are the shared challenges now? Indeed, we have a lot of challenges. Okay, so we have a more distinguished guest uh, from uh, UK, uh, Professor Kara Figurura. From, uh, she is the director of MA Cultural Policy, Relations and the Diplomacy of Me. Uh, the press I studied before. Nice press, I love the culture. And uh, also, we have uh, 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 Vice President Professor uh, Venka Purusho Thama uh, from Singapore. And he is Vice President and uh, Provost at the College of the Arts of Singapore. Welcome. And we have a professor from Japan, Yuko uh, Kawamura, and she is a professor of Seki University. Welcome. And also we have an uh, excellent Taiwanese scholar, and uh, the, now is the director of Taiwan Association of Cultural Policy Studies, uh, Dr. Pui Junyin, Junyin Wei. So let's give them a round of applause and welcome them to share their experience with us. Uh, 
we follow the order, okay? And uh, you guys have about 15 to 15 minutes, uh, 12 to 15 minutes to, to uh, share your experience. Thank you.
understanding of how things work, what we view as international or global, is actually always generated at the very local level, and that everything is connected. However, in terms of the um, effects of the climate um, crisis, this can be um, can create very paradoxical effects. So cognitive dissonance can happen between um, community change, which is felt very locally, and then the perception of climate change as something that is global. However, this perception of global also enables the formation of links across countries and transnationally. Um, here I don't have the, the quotations. You can refer to the paper for all the quotations, but I, I like this um, quote I took from that we have a moral obligation not to screw up the world for everyone because everyone matters. I know this is something that is discussable and I often find that is something that we actually don't discuss when others don't think like us and what we should do in relation to this matter. Because a climate crisis is something that we have to deal with together. And when there are those that don't acknowledge that there, there is even a crisis, or that they have other values that they feel is more important, how should we act? How should we position ourselves in relation to this matter? Um, maybe this is something we can explore in our um, conversations afterwards. So again, in terms of our positioning, we feel humanity is one, no one owns culture, and that culture changes over time, and that there are many ways in which to be part of a cultural group. Essentially, identity is multiple. Um, and obviously, I'm coming from a very particular region. Um, I'm originally from Portugal, but I've been living in the UK for 15 years. Um, so, overall, Europe, um, very particular UK, and now a UK that is Brexiting from Europe. Um, also, where there's a lot of concerns with sometimes very particular cultural um, characteristics and cultural identities. Um, and I sometimes fear that this turn towards essentialism to particular cultural particularisms can be an impediment to a broader view of humanity. So we get bogged down into I'm this and this and essentializing those characteristics and see that actually we are all human and we are in this earth together with others and with nature and that we need to do something um, in terms of the challenges we have together. And we do feel that cultural relations and here thought broadly can make a difference. And I was happy to hear a professor Lau talking about that it's not about power, because often we feel, fall into this default of power. But it has to be something that is inclusive, that is contextualized, to which we have to be committed, and not just be a one-off um, interaction. Because we will have to work with others, some not close to us, and we need to make this a collective action. Also, it's difficult to change systems. So the best way to change it is to start with the individual and to those close to us and open up in that sense. But I said the topic was the role of higher education. And in terms of, the, of higher education, I do feel that sometimes we are um, an impediment to the development of thinking because we tend to think in disciplines which are siloed from each other that think in narrow terms. And in this paper we were reflecting mostly in the disciplines of international relations and um, cultural policy. And briefly in terms of in traditional terms, we are um, very much um, in terms of international relations, concerned with modern sovereign states and their relationships. And when we talk, in this case, 
we feel the crisis that we still face? And Carla, while you are talking, there is a term that comes to me, fun de siècle, the end of the century, the French term. And if we, the fun of siècle, the end of the century, if we put the adjective anthropocentric, fun de siècle, and means that the human being is real in the crisis. But how can we change the whole world? How can culture play a critical role to help to change the whole world? I think perhaps that is another way. And uh, uh, the ministry, uh, Minister of Culture, Zheng Lijun, often said and promoted the idea of every ministry is a cultural ministry. And what does it mean? It means that, it, it doesn't mean that uh, Minister Zheng wanna took all the resources and the budget uh, from other ministries. No. It means that that think and act from the perspective of culture. This is what does it mean. Okay, so we have the second uh, speaker, Professor Venka Burrasho Tama, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the ministry, the museum, uh, Jerry and the association, and Kat for inviting me here uh, to, to share with you some of the things that I've been deliberating and researching in relation to where I come from, which is Singapore and Southeast Asia in particular. And, and this is very, very important in terms of how we also manifest ourselves in uh, Words like challenging, changing, sophisticated, complex are part of our vocabulary today. But how are we moving as a society? How are we transforming ourselves as a society? How are we engaging with different concerns that we have in society? And is the uh, uh, ambit of culture the only approach to looking at it? So these are kinds of concerns that we generally have. And I'm always interested in how artists and, and communities engage with these issues and how do they engage at a very much a local level and at an international level through their practices. So my, my uh, uh, talk is really about looking at cultural networks and, and, and uh, the new education. And it, it's, it's premised through my own research around what cultural diplomacy really needs today. So, in, in, in terms of cultural diplomacy, there are three considerations that I would like to put forth. First, a very practical one. Uh, in, in many ways, cultural diplomacy is about understanding the world and understanding your neighbors. And the wonderful example of the, the, you know, the chest that traveled around the world and, and creating an understanding about who you are, what you are, what you represent. And, and uh, is, is this a, a, a soft political manifestation or is it a direct trade manifestation, it is a, a sense of collegiality, and, and throughout centuries, these exchanges have been part and parcel of the diplomatic engagement that we have had with neighborliness. Of course, in ancient times, you know, through concepts of marriage, uh, diplomacy took place, through concepts of, you know, uh, vessel systems, vessel states, you know, uh, people understood the worlds, and people carved out worlds in, in different forms. On a practical level, cultural diplomacy is also about changing perceptions. Who am I to the rest of the world? How do I want to be perceived? How do I shape the way I am seen by others? And that's a very practical, uh, 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 applicable activity that many governments deal with on an everyday basis. So when we send a cultural entourage, you know, excel a, a, a dance troupe to another country, we are actually changing perceptions of our understanding very, very simply at a people-to-people -people level, what it means. On a practical level, governments also look at cultural diplomacy to deal with hard economic decisions and easing tensions. What does it mean when hard economic decisions are being made, and how do they ease tensions when there are people along the way who are affected by it, when countries are affected by it? And at a very practical level, Cultural diplomacy is more than just the arts. And the, like we, we talked about earlier, 
you know, uh, the, the fact that there is every ministry is a cultural ministry, every activity, every university is a cultural institution. Every thing that we do is within the ambit of a cultural enterprise. So we also need to understand that a, a lot of cultural diplomacy today where uh, uh, many countries start at a, what I call a low-hanging fruit, they just often look at the arts as a simple way of engaging with the external world. Then there is a theoretical consideration that we need to look at cultural diplomacy. And, and sometimes we, we don't look at this very, very deeply, but increasingly in literature, if you, if you read foreign policy or foreign affairs, if you read you know, journals, academic journals, and if you start to read public policy, then you find that the relationship between what is considered foreign, what is considered public, and what is considered cultural in that sense becomes a contested terrain. And, and today, when we start to look at what is foreign policy, and how foreign policy determines the world, and how public policy that deals with the level of the grassroots needs to be reconciled much more than ever before. So for example, governments are increasingly finding that they need to explain their foreign policy to their publics. Previously, you, you, you remember a world at a time where governments never kind of explained to their publics what foreign policy damage they had. They dealt with domestic policy, which is public policy. And you can talk to many people in the public, you know, say, what's your government's position on this issue? Oh, I don't know. The awareness. Right? But more than ever before, you see a, a greater awareness in this particular realm. Another problem or consideration with cultural diplomacy is the fact that there is an absolute over-interdependence on government international relations as a means of cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy does not necessarily have to always be through governmental agency. Right? There are many, many uh, examples of you know, border crossing that happens. You look at you know, China-Russia border, you look at India-Pakistan border. There are people-to-people -people flows that are happening on a regular basis through a, 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 a continuum of cultural practices, uh, uh, shared histories, and shared perspectives. All right? So today, if you read the literature around cultural diplomacy, much of it is contained within foreign policy. For example, we come from, I come from Southeast Asia, and much of Southeast Asia is defined by only two policies, foreign policy and economic policy, right? These are the two key determinants, you know, by and large. And over time, and much of Asia has been primarily determined by those two ambits, right? And so how do we start to create a particular flow? So if you come into Southeast Asia, pre-colonialism, much of the culture was determined by water because the heart of Southeast Asia is the South China Sea, right? It is not the land. It was a seafaring environment where the fishermen lived in the sea, their houses were in the sea, but ultimately they went to land to just rest, but they lived in the sea. So the shift and the paradigmatic shift on the way cultures operate through archipelagic societies have clearly shifted where the world is organized around land conquest and demarcations of nation states through you know, uh, land and property and the financialization of property. Then we, we talked about, and it's a point that Carla raised, the fact that you know, global leadership versus domestic grassroots leadership. So today, you find you know, political leaders are expected to be world statesmen, all right, speaking about global issues, but they still have to be voted in by the grassroots leadership element. And that relationship is very, very important. How do you position them? The world's problems are global problems, but the solutions are all localized solutions. So in that sense, that example of federal system and city mayor system is also raising another important problem. Are we having enough leadership globally to look for common global solutions to common global problems because all responses are primarily localized today. A third consideration is the political consideration in cultural diplomacy. You also have who do you want to be diplomatic to? There are large nation states and small nation states. So if you are a small nation state and if you send a big box of check, uh, uh, 
a chest full of goods, who do you send it to? And what does that symbolism mean? And who do you relate? And do small nation states get ignored? There's a convention and a, and a gathering of small nation states coming together to, to really look at how we can support each other. But then you also have small nation states that are also wealthy, like Singapore, like Qatar, right? Uh, and, and so you find that small nation states are also finding ways to say, how do I position myself in the global stage? Where cultural diplomacy does not allow the voice of the small nation states to be much. It's the big players, all right? So you've got the big players today, you know, the trade war between China and the US occupies everyone. But what happens all to all the in-between, all right? What is happening to the in-between and what are the opportunities